Today, we will be looking at dismantling racism um, to continue an important part of the study of our eighth principle. We will bring uh, to light these er uh, three areas. Mike Clausen will discuss the observance of Memorial Day by um, freed slaves after the Civil War. Jeanette Clausen will read a, ser a series of uh, eulogies uh, along with the assistance of some of our other members. And we will also share information on um, the murdered and missing indigenous women. Our goal is to uh, connect with the information about the worth and dignity of the individuals whose names and actions have been lost in light of uh, the fight for freedom in the Americas. Um, this this uh, is recorded. And um, so you know that. Um, and it, the, the recording will be turned off where, while we do Joyce and Concern, so you can be speak freely just to us. So we'll now begin our service. Come into the circle of love and justice. Come into the community of caring and compassion. Come and you shall know peace and joy. I wanna welcome all of you to this special service today. Um, it's a beautiful day and it's a beautiful weekend, a weekend in which we celebrate all those women and men who have served in the military, uh, serve for all of us. There are a few members of our fellowship and I will read them. And unfortunately, I, I'm going by my own memory and the memories of others. But if I've missed you and you served in the military, please let me know. Barry Bast, Joe Bernhardt, Tom Clark, James Iverson, Jill Iverson, Todd Geimer, Bill Kirkpatrick, Ron Kosick, Robert C. Aker, and Dick Urban. Is there anyone else among us or that you know in our fellowship that served in the military? So this is a wonderful weekend for us to celebrate. We're celebrating today as a part of our service and then we will culminate our celebration tomorrow when we as a group <clears throat> march in the Memorial Day Parade. And for those of you who may have joined us later, um, we are to gather somewhere south of the um, courthouse pub at 8.30 tomorrow morning. And we'll have a car. Dick Urban will be driving his Corvette. Uh, we'll have signs relative to our fellowship. We'll have flags for everybody. And if you have a Side with Love t-shirt or sweatshirt, be sure to, to wear that celebration. So today, in addition to celebrating um, our comrades who have served us and those who are not a member of our group, we're also going to, to celebrate some women some women of color, some indigenous women, whose memory is not as <clears throat> is not an everyday um, parlance in the way that our veterans have. So, as a part of this service, at the conclusion, we will be talking about some of those women in particular who have served our country in one way or another. We will also have the opportunity to say her name. We've been saying her name many or his name many times in reference to George Floyd and others, but this is an opportunity for us to say the names of many of these women. With that brief introduction, are there any announcements that people would like to make other than the um, what we've already talked about? Kathy. Okay, I, I want to just point out two things. When many of you, uh, some of you didn't hear this, but um, there uh, is a, um, after the parade on Tuesday, uh, would that be Tuesday, at noon, 
there is a ribbon cutting for the new Painting Pathways Clubhouse. And we and if you are interested and want to support this, wear your shirt again and come to the ribbon cutting. And then all day long uh, from 10 to 6, there is an open house. So if you can't make noon or whatever, do consider stopping in and seeing what they have done to that beauty. Do you all know where it is? On Washington Street? I, I suspect. If not, let me know and I'll get you the address. And then we did, we were discussing the People's Power Summit. Um, and so if you didn't hear, it's, it's, it's really important that if you're going to be coming and we urge you to go, that you sign, uh, register in advance. And um, we can send out again the, the link to do that so that you could get yourself um, ready. That's it. Any other announcements? Okay, at this point, we will light the chalice to commemorate the beginning of our official service. We light this chalice as a symbol of our commitment to fellowship and to each other. May our many spirits meet and merge in communion of heart and soul. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest for truth is our sacrament and service is our prayer to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to share strength and fellowship, thus do we covenant. Today's reading is from the Gray Book number 583 by Archibald McClesh, The Young Dead Soldiers. The young dead soldiers do not speak. Nevertheless, they are heard in the still houses. Who has not heard them? They have a silence that speaks for them at night and when the clock counts. They say, we were young, we have died, remember us. They say, we have done what we could, but until it is finished, it is not done. They say, we have given our lives, but until it is finished, no one can know what our lives gave. They say, our deaths are not ours, they are yours. They will mean what you make them. They say whether our lives and our deaths were for peace and a new hope or for nothing, we cannot say. It is you who must say this. They say we leave you our deaths. Give them their meaning. We were young, they say. We have died. Remember us. shall not bow down to racism we shall not bow down to injustice we shall not bow down to exploitation oh, what's he gonna do i'm gonna stay Sweet Honey 
in the rock <coughs> singing, I'm going to stand. In defense of our country and our ideals, and we express gratitude to those who have served. Today, we also are going to remember the forgotten. We will look back at the roots of Memorial Day. We will explore Black women who are dying at the hands of those sworn to protect them. We will look at the violence against the women of our First Nations who have little protection or redress in the face of the violence. In her book, Cast, Isabel Wilkerson said, the Confederacy may have lost the war, but they won the all important peace. Now Mike will provide information about the origins of Memorial Day. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow is Memorial Day, a day of memory, day to remember, but remember what? The clear answer is in memory of the dead. But how did it start and what was the intention of having this specific day? And why did it change from Decoration Day to Memorial Day? When the Civil War concluded in 1865, April, it left at least 600,000 Americans dead and many with their lives torn apart forever. On April 25, 1866, in Columbus, Mississippi, an annual tradition was begun to reflect on the cost of war and the loss of life. Eventually, in 1889, on May 30th, the national holiday Decoration Day was formally recognized. It was later changed to Memorial Day, but not until 1970. One of the things that made that day in Columbus, Mississippi so notable is that the attendees decorated all the graves, the blue and the gray alike. Imagine that. They lost the war. Their family, their state, their culture suddenly changed forever. And yet they were able to recognize the humanity of all the fallen. And so they honored all the dead, Union soldiers as well as Confederates. It was a day of respect and mourning and loss. Their example helped in the healing of the nation, a time of grief and loss, one of fear for the future. But that wasn't the first Decoration Day. Let's go back a year earlier to May 1st, 1865, just a couple of weeks after the war ended. In Charleston, South Carolina, at the site of a former war prison for captured Union soldiers, 10,000 freed slaves gathered to honor the hundreds of Union soldiers who died there and had been just dumped in a mass grave. They reburied the dead and decorated the new graves with roses and other spring flowers. Patriotic songs, preachers, abolitionists, and of course, armloads of flowers marked the event. It was celebrated with tears of joy and gratitude for the sacrifices made for their freedom. Honor to the country, celebration of those who survived, joy at their freedom as ex-slaves. Flowers and singing express that joy. One description from Yale historian David Blight reads, what you have there is black Americans recently freed from slavery, announcing to the world with their flowers, their feet and their songs, what the war had been about. What they basically were creating was the Independence Day of a second American Revolution. <clears throat> because the prison was at a horse racing track, they named the site the Martyrs of the Race Course. Things quickly got more complicated. In the North, emphasis was placed on the preservation of the Union, and it made the flag the focus of the honor, a day to celebrate and gather, very similar to Independence Day. Decoration Day emphasizes the flowers and the flags and leaves space for celebration, which leads to recreation and picnics. In the South, a distinct day called Confederate Memorial Day competes. Even today, in Alabama, Mississippi, and South Carolina, it is an official state holiday, with several more Southern states unofficially recognizing it. The emphasis of that day is on the loss of the war, the missing fathers and brothers and sons. Meanwhile, up north, the joy and celebratory nature accelerated. In less than 10 years, the arguments about frivolity had already begun in full force. By 1883, holiday sports were common. Down south, 
The National Day of Memory was mostly ignored in favor of the Confederate Memorial Day in April. After World War I, there was increased acceptance in the South as it became less focused on the Civil War and more inclusive of all the new wars. In many ways, we still live in two distinct countries when it comes to the Civil War and its aftermath. We may have national unity for Memorial Day, especially the baseball part, but for those places still insisting on the Confederate version, that split is very much with us today. And now back to Jeanette. Say Her Name was launched in December of 2014 by the African American Policy Forum and Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies. The Say Her Name campaign brings awareness to the often invisible names and stories of black women and girls who have been victimized by police violence and provides support to their families. Black women and girls as young as age seven and as old as 93 have been killed by the police, though we rarely hear their names. Knowing their names is a necessary but not sufficient condition for lifting up their stories, which in turn provides a much clearer view of the wide ranging circumstances that make black women's bodies disproportionately subject to police violence. To lift up their stories and illuminate police violence against black women, we need to know who they are how they lived, and why they suffered at the hands of police. On May 20th, 2015, at Union Square in New York City, AAPF hosted Say Her Name, a vigil in memory of black women and girls killed by the police. For the first time, family members of black women came together from across the country for a powerful vigil designed to draw attention to their loved ones' stories. The family members of Alberta Spruill, Rekia Boyd, Chantel Davis, Shelley Fry, Kayla Moore, Kayam Livingston, Miriam Carey, Michelle Cousseau, and Tanisha Anderson were present and supported by hundreds of attendees, activists, and supporters. Over the past five years, the Say Her Name campaign has expanded and increased its focus on direct advocacy. Since 2015, AAPF has hosted its annual Say Her Name Mother's Weekend in New York City, bringing together a group of mothers who have lost their daughters. The weekend served as a chance to learn more about the specific needs of the family members of Black women who are victims of racist state violence and provide a space where these mothers can begin to construct a community of support and a network for activism. Including Black women and girls in police violence and gender violence discourses sends the powerful message that indeed all Black lives matter. If our collective outrage around cases of police violence is meant to serve as a warning to the state that its agents cannot kill without consequence, our silence around the cases of Black women and girls sends the message that certain deaths do not merit repercussions. Please join us in our efforts to advance a gender inclusive narrative in the movement for black lives. Now I will take seven minutes to say the names of the women and girls killed by police violence in the last 20 years. Micaiah Bryant, Priscilla Slater, Tiffany Alexis Eubanks, Brianna Taylor, Tina Davis, Tatiana Jefferson, Laileen Polanco, Crystal Daniel Ragland, Pamela Shante Turner, Nina Adams, Latasha Nicole Walton, Eleanor Northington, Angel Viola DiCarlo, April Webster, Janice Dotson Steffens, Tamika Lachey Simpson, 
Aliyah Mariah Jenkins, Lahuana Phillips, Derisha Blackwell, Lashanda Anderson, Shukri Ali Saad, Desinthia Clemens, Alkita Elena Walker, Crystalline Barnes, Geraldine Townsend, Carrie Ann Hithen, Sandy Giardola, Kiwi Herring, India Nelson, Charlena Lyles, Joni Block, Robin White, Doreen Chase, Alteria Woods, Elena Mondragon, Morgan London Rankins, Michelle Lee Shirley, Deborah Danner, Corin Gaines, Jessica Nelson Williams, Simone Marshall, Derisha Armstrong, Keisha Arone, LaRonda Sweet, Waikisha Wilson, India Beatty, Keisha Michael, Shala Ridgeway, Janet Wilson, Ginia McMillan, Betty Jones, Barbara Dawson, Markesha McMillan, Reddell Jones, Raynette Turner, Ralkina Jones, Joyce Kernell, Kendra Chapman, Sandra Bland, Alexia Christian, Maya Hall, Megan Hockaday, Monique Jean Descard, Janisha Fonville, Natasha McKenna, Yvette Henderson, Dawn Renee Cameron, Shonda Mickelson, Aura Rosser, Seneke Proctor, Irtha Lilly, Tracy Ann Oglesby Wade, Latandra Ellington, Michelle Cousseau, Angela Betis Randolph, Pearlie Golden, Nimali Henry, Yvette Smith, Ariel Levy, Sharon Rebecca McDowell, Angelique Stiles, Miriam Carey, Gabriela Navarez, Chantel Davis, Kayam Livingston, Courtney Hahn, Kendra Diggs, Kayla Moore, Barbara Lassier, Linda Sue Davis, Yolanda Thomas, Shelley Fry, Darnisha Harris, Melissa Williams, Erica Collins, Alessia Thomas, Chantel Davis, Charmel Edwards, Rakia Boyd, Therese Francis, Jamila Barnett, Yvonne McNeil, Anna Brown, Denise Gay, Kataba Howard, Talia Barnes, Armetta Foster, Brenda Williams, Dernisha Clay, Carolyn Moran Hernandez, Gwendolyn Killings, 
Ciara Lee, Letha Coretta Adams, Arika Hainsworth, Ayana Stanley Jones, Sukeba Jackson Oluwami, Anha Dixon, Linda Hicks, Sarah Riggins, Catherine Shaw, Martina Brown, Amanda Anderson, Tirnika Jenkins, Yvette Williams, Brenda Williams, Barbara Stewart, Duana Johnson, Tamikia Jordan, Lori Jean Ellis, Latoya Greer, Anita Gay, Tarika Wilson, Elaine Coleman, Rayora Askew, Dorothy Williams Johnson, Denise Nicole Glasgow, Milisha Thompson, Yuanda Peterson, Linda Joyce Friday, Clara Morris, Catherine Johnston, Reka Kalawi Budai, Erica Tyrone, Shatika Fuller, Emily Marie Delafield, Mary Malone Jeffries, Maitia Grooms, Carolyn Jean Daniels, Shirley Andrews, Jamila Yasmin Arshad, Summer Marie Lane, Andrea Umfrey, Annie Holliday, Desaria Whitmore, Adebusola Tyru, Tereshia Tasha Daniel, Denise Michelle Washington, Alberta Spruill, Kendra James, Charkisa Johnson, Niza Mori, Tessa Hardiman, Martha Donald, Lavetta Jackson, Sophia King, Marcella Bird, Andrea Nicole Reedy, Thomasina Brown. Jim will now present the eulogy of Fannie Lou Hamer, a woman who survived police violence and made significant contributions to justice and freedom in our country. <clears throat> Fannie Lou Townsend Hamer rose from humble beginnings in the Mississippi Delta to become one of the most important, passionate and powerful voices in the civil and voting rights movements and a leader in the efforts for greater economic opportunities for African Americans. Hammer was born in 1917 in Montgomery County, Mississippi, the 20th and last child of sharecroppers. She grew up in poverty and at the age of six joined her family picking cotton. By age 12, she left school to work. In 1944, she married Perry Hamer and the, coil, the couple toiled on the Mississippi plantation owned by B.D. Marlowe until 1962. Because Hamer was the only worker who could read and write, she also served as plantation timekeeper. In 1961, Hamer received a hysterectomy by a white doctor without her consent while undergoing surgery to remove a uterine tumor. Such forced sterilization of black women as a way to reduce the black population was so widespread it was dubbed a Mississippi appendectomy. <clears throat> that summer, Hamer attended a meeting led by civil rights activist James Foreman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and James Bevel of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. <clears throat> Thank you. Hamer was incensed by efforts to deny Blacks the right to vote. She became a SNCC organizer and on August 31st, 1962, led 17 volunteers to register to vote at the Mississippi Courthouse. 
Denied the right to vote due to an unfair literacy test, the group was harassed on their way home when police stopped their bus and fined them $100 for the trumped up charge that the bus was too yellow. <clears throat> that night, plantation owner Marlo fired Hamer for her attempt to vote. Her husband was required to stay until the harvest. Marlo confiscated much of their property and the Hamers then moved to Ruleville, Mississippi with very little left of their own. In 1963, after successfully completing a voter registration program in Charleston, South Carolina, Hamer and several other black women were arrested for sitting in a whites only restaurant in Winona, Mississippi. At the Winona jailhouse, she and several of the women were brutally beaten, leaving Hamer with lifelong injuries from a blood clot in her eye, kidney damage, and, and leg damage. In 1964, Hamer's national reputation soared as she co-founded the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which challenged the local Democratic Party's efforts to block Black participation. Hamer and the other members went to the Democratic National Convention that year arguing to be recognized as the official delegation. When Hamer spoke before the Credentials Committee, calling for mandatory integrated state delegations, President Lyndon Johnson held a televised press conference so she would not get any television airtime. But her speech with its poignant descriptions of racial prejudice in the South was televised later. By 1968, Hamer's vision for racial parity and delegations had become a reality, and Hamer was a member of Mississippi's first integrated delegation. In 1964, Hamer helped organize Freedom Summer, which brought hundreds of college students, black and white, to help with African-American voter registration in the segregated South. 1964, she announced her candidacy for the Mississippi House of Representatives, but was barred from the ballot. A year later, Hamer, Victoria Gray, and Annie Devine became the first black women to stand in the U.S. Congress when they unsuccessfully protested the Mississippi House election of 1964. She also traveled extensively, giving powerful speeches on behalf of civil rights. In 1971, <laughs> Hamer helped to found the National Women's Political Caucus. Frustrated by the political process, Hamer turned to economics as a strategy for greater racial equality. In 1968, she began a pig bank to provide free pigs for black farmers to breed, raise, and slaughter. A year later, she launched the Freedom Farm Cooperative, buying up land that blacks could own and farm collectively. With the assistance of donors, she purchased 640 acres and launched a co-op store, boutique, and sewing enterprise. She single-handedly ensured that 200 units of low-income housing were built. Many still exist in Realville today. She died of breast cancer at age 59. At her memorial service, Andrew Young, the United States delegate to the United Nations, led thousands of mourners, most of them black, in several hours of tribute to the best-known citizen of this small Mississippi town of Realville, Fannie Lou Hamer, the former sharecropper, turned civil rights leader. Thank you, Jim. Imagine if Fannie Lou Hammer had been killed in police custody in 1963. Her significant contributions to the civil rights movement and racial parity would have been lost. Sandra Annette Bland, was born on February 7, 1987, and died July 13, 2015. She was from Naperville, Illinois, and was one of five sisters. She attended Willowbrook High School in Villa Park, Illinois. She went to the college Prairie, Prairie View A&M University in Waller County, Texas, where she was a member of the Sigma Gamma Rho sorority. She graduated in 2009 with a degree in agriculture. At Prairie View, she was recruited as a summer counselor for three years. She played in the marching band and volunteered for a senior citizens advocacy group. Bland returned to Illinois in 2009. She worked in, administrative, in administration for Cooks Direct 
a food service equipment supplier. She had been due to start a job on July 3rd, 2015 with Prairie View A&M University. In January, Bland began posting videos to her Facebook page under the title, Sandy Speaks, about many subjects, including police mistreatment of African-Americans. In one post, she wrote, in the news that we've seen of late, you could stand there, surrender to the cops, and still be killed. She has been described as a civil rights activist in Chicago and a part of the Black Lives Matter movement. She described the videos she made for her social media as a calling from God and urged people to share them, saying she believed she was here to change history. Geneva Reed Veal, Bland's mother, recalled one of her last conversations with her daughter. She said, Mama, now I know what my purpose is. My purpose is to go back to Texas. I'm going to Texas to make it better. She drove through the night from Chicago for a July 9th interview. She got the job and returned the next day to fill out paperwork. On her way back, a state trooper stopped her for failing to signal a lane change. Bland had 10 previous traffic related encounters with police in Illinois and Texas, multiple stops for speeding, erratic driving and driving without insurance. Hundreds attended the funeral of Sandra Bland at the DuPage African Methodist Episcopal Church. Sandra was remembered as a courageous fighter for social justice as family and friends continued to question her death. Remembered by those at her church home as an outspoken, smart and active member, during the service mourners inside the full chapel, along with the overflow crowd outside, were asked to celebrate her life, even as many questioned the circumstances of her death. We celebrate that Sandy Bland was a young lady who refused to be subdued and silenced, said Reverend Teresa Deer, DuPage AME Church Associate Minister. The Saturday service came a day after an autopsy report released found that Bland used a plastic bag to hang herself after her controversial July 10th traffic stop, which was captured by squad car dash cam and shows a Texas trooper pulling Bland over for failing to signal a lane change. Sorry, Kathy will now provide us with memorials for, indig for indigenous women and girls. It, Native American women face murder rates more than three times than white women, according to the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Incomplete data collection and media coverage are also serious <clears throat> issues, according to the study by the Urban Indian Health Institute. For example, while the National Crime Information Center reported 5,712 missing women and girls, the Department of Justice missing persons data listed only 116, according to the study. And Linda writes, I found many names, but I'll say Linda did extensive study of examples of Native American women who had been killed. And I will just read one of them that some of you may be familiar with. Savannah Lafay LaFontaine Greenwood was excited to start her life. At 22, she was living with her parents and brother in a basement apartment in Far. She had recently gotten a job as a nursing assistant, hoping to fully qualify as a nurse specializing in elder care. A member of the Spirit Lake tribe, Savannah was born in Belcourt, moved to Fargo when she was young, and then moved to Spirit Lake Reservation at age nine. She lived on the reservation until moving to Fargo last year. Her father is a Spirit Lake Indian. Her mother is a member of the Turtle Mountain tribe of Chippewa, Chippewa Indians. She was reported missing August 19th to the police by her mother. After several days of fruitless consent searches by the police to the neighbor's apartment where she'd gone, finally her disappearance made the newspapers and a more serious effort was made to find her. A search warrant was five days <clears throat> was issued five days after the original report, including the facts that her cell phone and wallet were left behind. 
Family and friends of Savannah began a serious search for Savannah on Friday, August 25th. Savannah's body was found on Sunday night, August 27th, wrapped in plastic and lodged against a tree in the Red River, north of Fargo-Moorhead. Eight days of intensive searching by law enforcement and the public had failed to produce results. Rather, the discovery was made by accident by kayakers paddling the river for some weekend fun. They saw a body-sized object in the river and then contacted the police. Fortunately, there has been some improvement in this dreadful pattern since this incident. Several states have begun murdered and indigenous women task forces, including Wisconsin, formed by the Department of Justice. It was formed in July of last year and work is getting underway with the help of a $300,000 grant from the Department of Justice Violence Against Women Act grant program. Its task is to uncover the causes in the ep epidemic <clears throat> and provide policy recommend <clears throat> recommendations to law enforcement and to the state legislator. Native women, Native American women had also formed their own shelters for healing in Rapid City, South Dakota, where there are many murdered and missing Native women. The Red Ribbon Skirt Society is a Rapid City group dedicated to raising awareness about missing and murdered Indigenous women, children, two-spirited, and transgender people. What This is just one <clears throat> method of making people aware of the issue exemplified by the red dress installation. The red dress installation was held in, 19, in 2019 and again this year. It's just an effort to try to elucidate to the entire community in the world the fate of so many Native American women. There is hope but this issue needs attention. Thank you, Kathy, for that introduction for on behalf of uh, Native American and Indigenous women. And um, I will be sharing uh, for L'Oreal to Sin Jean. Uh, this is a billboard uh, that was, um, I don't know if you can see that, I guess not. Uh, uh, anyway, um, this was published in a April of 2018 in Winslow, Arizona. The Border Town Justice Coalition unveiled a billboard in Winslow as a memorial of the anniversary of the death of L'Oreal to Sinjin, who was shot and killed by former Winslow police officer, Austin Shipley, March 26, 2016. The 100 pound, five foot tall Navajo mother was 27 years old at the time she was shot five times at close range by Shipley. The police left to Thinjean's body on the street until 6 a.m. the next morning. The Navajo, Navajo Nation said that Tsinjin was left to die on the cold pavement without friends or family around to comfort her in her last moments. Since then, the outcry about her death has been mostly about justice in a dark hour calls for an investigation, discussions of racial profiling, the backdrop of a country torn by controversial police shootings. But on Tuesday, the outpouring was all about to Sinjin at, at her funeral. A wife, a mother, a Navajo woman whose name meant woman of sunshine the 14 rows of pews at the modest Cedar Springs Nazarene Church, about 40 miles north of Winslow, overflowed as words of comfort were whispered in tearful hugs. Scripture was quoted and echoed in song. Floranda Dempsey gave the eulogy 
speaking of her niece as having a tumultuous life plagued with personal trauma and the death of many loved ones. But still, she said, Tsinjin was able to prove that she was rightfully blessed by her Navajo name, Woman of Sunshine. Even with a broken heart that never recovered from devastation, she showed us what love should be about, Floranda said, pausing as her voice cracked. We will miss her tight hugs and beautiful smile and love. Family, friends, and members of the Navajo Nation believe Tosinjin suffered discrimination and was killed by excessive force. I am trying to understand, Navajo Nation spokesperson Neld said, we still shed tears. We didn't ask for this. It shouldn't have happened. The Reverend James Paddock, who led the closing prayer, prayer wondered aloud, how can we come out of it? How can we stop these happenings? How do we stop the demise of our society that we are in? Dathinjin was the youngest of four older brothers, two half brothers and a half sister and was raised religious as a child, but had strayed. Uh, Loranda, her aunt said her niece rededicated herself to the church in 2009. Although she didn't graduate from high school, Desinjin received her GED and a certificate in caretaking, which she was actively employed and pursuing um, at the time of her death. She married Michael Tsinjin and together they made what L'Oreal considered to be her greatest accomplishment of all her eight-year-old daughter, Tiffany. During the funeral, Tiffany floated around the church throughout the service, showing that she had inherited her mom's ability to give tight hugs, an uncle, a great aunt, a cousin, a friend. Each hug lasted no less than a minute and had just as much love as the one before it. A friend wonders, what if her childhood friend, Anna Guerrero, 28, says, wonders aloud, why they have to go and shoot her? They knew her and they knew her history. Guerrero said to Sinjin took medication to help with her issues. The drugs would cause L'Oreal to Sinjin to act out but she would always channel her energy in long walks or talks rather than being aggressive. She'd walk from one side of the town to the other side of town, Guerrero said, smiling. It was her favorite thing to do. Her friend recalled that Tsinjid would comment while they walked on these strolls on newly planted flowers, a freshly painted door, or a dog in the yard. She would observe things that her friends didn't notice or wouldn't admire because of not noticing, but L'Oreal Tsinjin noticed. Another time on a hot summer day, Tsinjin had laid down in the grass, appreciating the coolness of the grass and the trees cool shade over the grass. Remember the good days L'Oreal to Sinjid had asked her friend. We had no problems back then, no problems at all. Her friend, Anna Guerrero, tied a new balloon to the light pole where other trinkets have been left behind at the vigil site. It didn't have to end the way it did. They could have helped her, saved her. Of a special note, I'd like to extend a thank you to Native American poet, Denise Sweet, and also to the first Native American woman 
our 216 Poet Laureate of Wisconsin, Kimberly Blazer, who as our UU guest speaker a number of times has raised all of our awareness through her poetry and her activism. Thank you, Kathy and Jeanette. Experiencing a, another wonderful Thank song you. by the Sweet Honey in the Rock. Thank you, Kathy. Although we have read many names and told a few stories, there could be shared a lot more about so many unforgotten souls that we try to remember today. So as we close this service, think about the people that we don't know, those unnamed people, and bring them to your voice as you move forward. And again, I want to thank all of the members of our fellowship who served as veterans in <clears throat> over the years. And let us close with the Apache blessing. May the sun bring you new energy by day. May the moon softly restore you by night. May the rain wash away your worries. May the breeze blow new strength into your being. May you walk gently through the world and know its beauty in all the days of your life. And thank you so much to Jeanette and Mike for all of the work you did to provide for this lovely service today. <laughs>